Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conservation Conversations. My name is Ana Sangronis, and I work for the University of Florida IFAS Extension Service and Florida Sea Grant here in Miami-Dade County. This webinar series is a joint effort between UF IFAS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, and Miami-Dade County Eco Adventures. We will be continuing with this webinar series every second and fourth Wednesday at 12 noon for the next few months. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Everyone in this webinar is currently muted, so I ask that you please type any questions you have into the chat box, which I will be moderating. We will have the opportunity for questions at the end of the session. The webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out within the next week. Please follow us on social media where we will be announcing Wednesday's conversation topics during throughout the month. If instead you'd like to receive an email reminder with the two topics for the month, as well as the links to register, please let me know or indicate so in the chat box. Now I will turn it over to today's presenter, Dr. Ashley Smith. Hi, Anna. Thank you everyone for coming today. I'm excited to share some of what I think about every day uh, related to water quality and eutrophication. Oops, sorry about that. Just a reminder that this webinar will be recorded and available for your uh, viewing later and to share with friends and family. I'm Ashley. Uh, I am a faculty member at the Tropical Research and Education Center in Homestead, which is part of the University of Florida Institute for Food and Agricultural Sciences, or IFAS. My work at uh, tracking at UF is focused on coastal water quality, so something we're going to talk about today. Uh, my background is in coastal biogeochemistry, so I study how nutrients move between soils, sediments, water, and air, and the way that human activities affect these exchanges. When I think about my work in particular, I get a lot of questions about what is water quality, or you study water quality, well, what does that mean? So I put these two images here for us to think about for a sec. When I think of good water quality, I think of that white pristine, pristine beach with that clear water that I can see my feet in and I know what's around me. When I think of bad water quality, I think of those fish kills, algae on the beaches, even turning the water some colors that are not blue and I can't see to the, can't see to the sea floor with. The picture on the one side with the fish is not a beach that I want to go visit, while the other side is definitely a beach I would like to sit at. Thinking about these images, then, what is water quality? Water quality has two, is about the, how the water is for us to swim in, for us as humans to swim in, to drink, or to recreate in. In this example, it would be fish. So the EPA defines water quality as the goals of a water body by designating its uses, setting criteria to protect those uses, and then establishing provisions to protect the water from pollutants. So there's two main parts of this definition. The first is that how the water is used, so whether that would be for recreation, water supply, aquaculture, agriculture, and then the criteria are established based on those designated uses. So the water quality criteria for one water body might not be the same as another based on how that waterway is used. When you guys think about water quality, how do you determine what makes water quality? Uh, this is just a little poll question that we've just popped up for you to answer. We're going to give it about 10 more seconds, everybody.
Okay, spoiler alert, these are all types of water quality indicators. Uh, even salinity, because fresh water doesn't want to have a lot of salt in it, so it can be uh, a sign of poor water quality. Oops. So the term water quality is used to describe the condition of the water, the, including the chemical, physical, and biological characteristics. Uh, it's usually with, again, with respect to that purpose. So water quality is then affected by pollution. And the pollution is the contaminants of that water body. So whether that is the nutrients, the toxins, the sediments, these other aspects that can affect uh, the quality of that water. So there's different types of then water pollution or indicators that are biological, so bacteria and viruses like E. coli, fecal coliforms, uh, chemical like nutrients like nitrogen, pesticides, uh, drugs in the more of an urban environment. Uh, and then also physical conditions like sediments uh, or organic material like uh, leaves or grass clippings are also considered a pollutant and a sign of degraded water quality. Water these sources of pollution can be either point source, which is direct and like identifiable. So I can, <clears throat> I can actually point to where that pollution came from. You can think of this like a pipe. And then there's also non-point sources. And that is like, that is everything in the watershed. You can't directly say where that water, uh, where that pollution came from. Water quality is important. Uh, in 1972, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act was created. This is the modern day Clean Water Act. Uh, this is established to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our nation's waterways. The Clean Water Act has really been instrumental in the health of all in rivers, lakes, estuaries, coastal systems, uh, and has stopped billions of pounds of pollution from entering our waterways to make sure that they are safe. This image here is the Cuyahoga River. Uh, this really set the foundation for the Clean Water Act. The Cuyahoga River is in Ohio, and it was considered one of the most polluted rivers in the United States. Uh, there were at least 13 different fires on the Cuyahoga River because there's so many different chemicals, oils, uh, other pollutants that were in this water uh, that any little spark from a train passing by or a car would cause these fires. The largest river fire occurred in 1952 and caused more than $1 million worth of damage. It was really from then the 1969 fire where, the Time, where Time Magazine profiled it and described the Cuyahoga River as a river that oozes rather than flows and in which a person does not drown but decays. That set the stage for uh, conservation groups and local governments to per, uh, identify ways to protect and control our water quality. So the Cuyahoga River fires really focused public opinion on the importance of water quality and led to the need for more regulations for surface water uh, quality activities. When we talk about water quality, we have to know how to measure water quality. So when we think about where we get this information of water quality from our nation's streams, lakes, rivers, estuaries, uh, and identifying if they are safe to swim in or drink in or even use for irrigation. It all comes down to monitoring for water quality. There are a variety of ways to monitor water quality conditions, which I've identified a few here. We can use direct meters, putting things in the water to take samples, auto samplers. We can collect it by observation or diving. Secchi disks are a really fun and cheap way to look at water clarity. Uh, and then we are even using satellite images and uh, other digital photographs and satellites to look at different color indicators of water quality. So the physical measurements are the general conditions like temperature, flow, water color, water clarity, and then the conditions of the banks. The biological measurements we make are related to the abundance of animals and aquatic life that are in the water. That would be what your diver is looking for usually. To monitor and maintain the water quality uh, requires us to go out and to do these monitorings. This, there are five purposes to having monitoring activities. 
or continuously going to and revisiting locations to see how water quality is changing over time. Uh, we need to monitor our waterways to look for those trends so we know what is the baseline level of water quality to identify specific and emerging problems that might be occurring, whether they're one-off events or even like larger, uh, this is a becoming a larger problem. And then we need to monitor so we can design different solutions. So we know ways that the water functions, that water works, and that waterway works to develop solutions for water quality problems that are effective for that location. Uh, and monitoring also allows us to decide if the regulations that we put in place actually are working. Uh, and to develop responses to emergencies such as oil spills uh, or other or floods. They create these indicators. We also monitor quality by regulating point source discharge. When we have those pipes that we can point to, we are able to know how much water enters, how much water leaves or how much water enters waterways through these pipes and then what is in that water too. When we think about indicators of water quality, what are we monitoring for? There's a suite of different things that we use to measure it, many of which that you guys all identified in the poll. Uh, temperature is one. We don't want to have temperature loading or pulses of heat events. Dissolved oxygen is another indicator of water quality because it links directly to aquatic life. pH, a lot of who have aquariums think a lot about pH. Uh, and definitely down here where we have our corals and ocean acidification is another uh, pH, importance of pH. Nutrients are an indicator of water quality like nitrogen and phosphorus. Turbidity or the amount of sediments or particles in the water and then other bio indicators. Uh, that's like chlorophyll or heavy metals can also be used as indicators of water quality. Poor water quality is when we have pollution. Two of this, those indicators have changed. The one thing that I think the most about is nutrient pollution, like nitrogen and phosphorus. Nutrient pollution in particular comes from when there are too many nutrients that enter the water bodies and then cause that excessive algae growth. Nutrients come from a variety of different sources. Uh, there's natural ways that nutrients enter water bodies like weathering. And then we also have human related inputs such as fertilizer and runoff. So if you're like me, it's a little tough to think about nutrients as a pollutant because we need nutrients. They are essential for our life. They form the foundation of our cells. But when we have too many nutrients, they're a bad thing. So I have these two different ecosystems, your healthy ecosystem with good water quality where just the right amount of nutrients are entering. And then your eutrophic system or with bad water quality where too many nutrients are entering. There's also a lot of impervious surface from urban development in that watershed. Uh, and then that's what causes these algae blooms with consequences for light availability to the sediment communities and also with changes in dissolved oxygen. So I think about nutrients like I think about coffee. I need coffee to start my day, but if I have too much coffee, I'm going to talk like this blah, 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 and my system's going to crash by the end of the day. That's how nutrients are for our aquatic systems. They need some nutrients. They need to keep things going and cycling but too much of it will cause the system to crash and it will take a long time for it to recover. The process of too many nutrients uh, entering our systems is called eutrophication. Eutrophication has a lot of different parts to the definition. So I just wanted to see what you guys think about when you hear eutrophication. We'll give you a minute to answer this poll too.
Okay, guys, we'll give it about 15 more seconds. Yeah, this one's pretty easy. It's all of the above and you all got it right. Uh, because eutrophication is all of these, uh, all these aspects. It, it's from too many nutrients. It can cause loss of biodiversity. And then there's a variety of different ways that human activity does link to eutrophication. I don't know how that red line appeared. So I apologize. Uh, the technical definition of eutrophication is an increase in the rate of supply of organic matter to the ecosystem. So the technical definition by Nixon 1995, which is the definition that I use as a coastal biogeochemist, doesn't even have nutrients in the definition. However, we can break this definition down to understand the different pieces of the definition. So an increase in the rate of supply, and then that would be caused by Increase in the rate of supply of organic matter. So the increased rate could be caused by excess nutrients, loss of grazers or other benthic habitats that can control the organic matter. Increased organic matter loads in general uh, is a cause of eutrophication. That would be like your grass clippings or your litter, uh, leaf litter. And then land use changes are also a cause of the increase in rate of supply. But the organic matter that we see, that response, is generally the algae, the algal growth, that algal bloom. And then the ecosystem is then our bays, estuaries, and lakes. So like Lake Okeechobee or even here in Biscayne Bay. This is a figure from my PhD advisor who focused on where they created this conceptual diagram to show where all the different sources of nutrients are and how the nutrients that are in our watersheds are eventually processed and removed and make their way down to the coast. So we have all this runoff and two, as nutrients run off into the waterway, that excess nitrogen and phosphorus causes an algal growth. As the algae die and decompose, that process sucks out oxygen from the water column, creating these low oxygen zones. But whatever's not used is then exported further down into the ocean. We are all pretty familiar here in Florida with eutrophication. This is an image from the Miami Herald of the St. Lucie River uh, estuary where they called, they said that too many nutrients caused the water to turn guacamole colored green. I just love this. I'm used to thinking of it as pea soup, but it's Miami guacamole. Uh, and then this is one that I actually took, or I found, was found on WLRN just today. This is the current fish kill that's happening right now in Biscayne Bay. These are the images that we associate with eutrophication and poor water quality. So there's two, the consequences then of too many nutrients are just that increased in algal productivity. We can even have harmful algal blooms where they release toxins. Uh, nuanced algal mats that we see that make navigational hazards. Uh, Low oxygen conditions result from too many nutrients. We have fish kills, loss of biodiversity, and then also loss of submerged aquatic vegetation. To step through this again, I put like our view of looking through a waterway where we have some vegetation on the sediments, on the benthos. We have oxygen in the water and a little bit of algae. That's those little stars. Then we have our development. We build our houses, we put our septic tanks in, and we have roadways and lawns that we're going to fertilize. When we have rain events, we have that uh, pulse then of nutrients and other pollutants to our waterways. Those nutrients cause the algae to bloom. This blocks light from the spenthic area, from the sediments. So seagrasses and other photosynthesizing organisms that live on the bottom can't get that light that they need. This affects oxygen availability as we lose that habitat and affects biodiversity. As the algae die and are decomposed and we don't have those primary producers, the seagrasses to add some oxygen back, we start to see lower oxygen availability, creating these dead zones or areas of low oxygen, hypoxia and anoxia. This is where we have those fish kills. Fish are not that smart and sometimes they'll get trapped in these bottom zones uh, 
these low oxygen zones. And then eventually when wind comes or something else, it turns them up and they'll float to the top. Dead zones are not a problem, are not just a local problem. They are a global problem. Uh, dead zones and coastal oceans have been spreading since the 1960s and have serious consequences for the way that coastal ecosystems function. World, uh, worldwide, this, they generally result from runoff of fertilizer and burning of fossil fuels. Dead zones have been reported in more than 400 systems affecting a total area of 245,000 square kilometers and are considered one of the key stressors to coastal, eco coastal marine ecosystems. In this image, which is a bit old by now, the dots are all systems that have indicated or have experienced dead zones, low oxygen. And you can see that they kind of fit along the, all the coasts. And then they also, the colors are different population intensities. So urbanization is being linked to these formations of the dead zones. So dead zones are all about the amount of dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is just the amount of oxygen molecules that are dissolved in the water. They're invisible to the naked eye. So you can't look at a waterway and say, oh, this has this DO. Uh, there are only two sources of oxygen to the water and that's either dissolved when it comes in contact with the atmosphere or produced by plants during photosynthesis. Uh, there are human, there are natural and human factors that affect dissolved oxygen. Uh, aquatic life can affect oxygen, either producing it or taking it up. Factors like salinity also affect the solubility, so the amount of oxygen that can be held in that water, where salty water holds less oxygen than fresh water. Temperature, uh, same thing with ability. Cold water holds more uh, oxygen than warmer water. And then human activities such as changes in land clearing causing those sources of pollution can all affect dissolved oxygen the way that so there are two there's normoxic which is like the general what you need the right amounts of oxygen and then we have hypoxia as a term you'll hear which is low dissolved oxygen and that's 0.3 to 2 milligrams per liter anoxia is little or no oxygen and that's zero to 0.2 milligrams per liter. For reference, you want about a 5.5 milligram per liter dissolved oxygen, uh, which can allow for a lot of life to live. So based on some of these categories of oxygen, it's the warm, salty water that would generally have lower dissolved oxygen as even their baseline, just because of the physical way that, uh, physical properties of water and oxygen. Animals have a different tolerance to dissolved oxygen. You have some organisms that are less tolerant, like striped bass, and then you have more tolerant organisms, like spot and then uh, some of the polychaetes and worms. So when you lose, when you start to be, have set systems that are more anoxic or hypoxic, you can start to shift into those more low tolerant organisms. So dissolved oxygen is one, and those fish kills are one sign of eutrophication. This is a figure from a NOAA report that looked at different uh, coastal estuaries in the US and put together this, how a number of estuaries that were okay, had no symptoms of eutrophication, and then number of estuaries that were high. And using that, they created this indi uh, these indicators so you can see the progression of going from a no problem to a problem, uh, generally related to nutrients. So in our no problem systems, we have oxygen, we have a nice amount of phytoplankton and seagrasses. But then over time, as systems become more and more eutrophic, we have that less oxygen. And we start to see a shift from seagrasses to macroalgae. And we also can start to see more nuance or toxic algal blooms rather than the algae that's supposed to be there. Uh, so when you're looking at waterways, you can think of a few things as signs of eutrophication. That can be those fish kills when you're told not to drink or go into the water. So shellfish and beach closures, that algal bloom, that turning that water, that guacamole colored green. Uh, it can also affect fishery production where you're not getting those same big fish that you used to catch. And then loss of habitat, including the disappearance of seagrass. 
As you think about some waterways in your community, and especially here in Biscayne Bay, can you think of some ways or signs or symptoms of eutrophication that you've seen? It was hard for me when I moved down to Florida from Chesapeake Bay, uh, where the water was always brown color. Uh, and that's what I associated water with. And then here in Biscayne Bay, seeing that water that was so clear all the time, shifting my mentality to uh, realizing that even though it is clear, it still has symptoms of eutrophication, including all these issues that we've just addressed on this poll question. So eutrophication happens not only in coastal systems, but also in freshwater systems. And just as some context, we often talk about nitrogen as the key pollution uh, source in saltwater systems and phosphorus as the key pollution uh, source in freshwater systems. And that's because phosphorus will actually bind to sediments. Uh, in the freshwater system and that salt from the salt water will actually cause that phosphorus to be released, making it no longer in a limiting nutrient. However, it's not so black and white as that. And sometimes it's actually more like the ratio between nitrogen and phosphorus that matters. That was all doom and gloom. <laughs> Our water quality is degrading. We're seeing loss of habitats. We have too many nutrients. But there are ways that we can mitigate eutrophication. The main way that we as a nation have tried to manage eutrophication is by creating mitigation strategies that focus on reducing nutrient loads in the watershed. This includes the creation of wastewater treatment plants, as well as stormwater retention ponds to trap some of that runoff uh, before it would enter the coastal system. Recently, more engineering approaches have been suggested for mitigation of eutrophication. This includes both ecological engineering, which is that uh, restoration of habitats that can store nutrients in their tissues and cells, and then also can help bury nutrients deeper into the sediments, and then can also facilitate a natural nitrogen removal process called denitrification, which is facilitated by microbes. So enhancing some habitats can prevent eutrophication and help to remove nitrogen. There's also hydraulic engineering. This is what we think about with some of the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan, where they're changing the flows of water. So this can increase the residence time, decrease the residence time. Uh, just changing when and where water moves can also be a mitigation strategy for eutrophication. So what can you do to reduce your nutrient footprint and prevent eutrophication? You don't want to be a big foot. Key, one of the key ways is to reduce your fossil fuel use. Fossil fuels produce uh, NOx, nitrous oxide, and that will actually can go up into the atmosphere and come back down as rain, which is what's in wet deposition, which is what's pictured in this image here. You can also eat less meat. Humans apply a lot of nitrogen to cropland each year. In fact, 170 million tons. That's worth, that's about the nitrogen equivalent of 1.5 million blue whales. So that's a lot of nitrogen. Of the nitrogen that we apply to uh, croplands and for animal consumption, only about 12% of that actually enters our mouth. So that's leaving a lot of nitrogen in the environment that used to not be there. So it, you can think about it this way. It takes 120, or 220 pounds of nitrogen in corn to produce 11 pounds of nitrogen in beef. There's a lot of places, there's a lot of reduction there and that ex excess nitrogen goes into our environment. 
We do have some success stories and active management can re uh, reverse human impacts and restore coastal eutrophication. The first success story I have is from Chesapeake Bay where they really had targeted focused nutrient load reduction over time. They did have a TMDL or a total maximum daily load, which was a government mandated nitrogen diet. Uh, and that has worked to reduce nitrogen inputs by about 24%. At the same time, they had really focused and targeted efforts to restore seagrass beds. Uh, that has led to a 315% increase in seagrass. So they're starting to see seagrass recovery and also less nutrients in the systems. Right here in Florida, we also have one of the best success stories. That's Tampa Bay. In Tampa Bay, there was population growth, nitrogen loading, chlorophyll, um, and those associated consequences with water clarity and seagrass loss. Over time and through focused efforts to manage the nitrogen load, they've reduced the nitrogen loading, mainly targeting point sources and then into non-point sources too. As they've been able to reduce nitrogen load, they also were then able to restore seagrass beds through enhanced fo for focusing on targeting restoration effort, targeted restoration efforts. So they've ultimately uh, reduced the nitrogen load and led to an increase in seagrass beds, all while population growth continues to increase in Tampa Bay area. And even the Cuyahoga River, today people recreate on it, swim in it, uh, fish in it. So it all comes back to really these actions that we can take within our watershed and water quality regulations that will help be tools in our toolbox for maintaining the health of our coastal of our waterways uh, and maintaining good water quality and preventing eutrophication. Thank you for your attention and we have a quick poll before I take any questions. Everyone would just please go ahead and answer these last few questions for us. That would be great. Please indicate your level of agreement with the following. I learned something from watching this webinar. Next question is how many people were watching this webinar? And the third is simply asking where you are joining us from. If you're within Miami-Dade County, another one of the counties in the Sunshine State, elsewhere in the US or elsewhere in the world. And I do wanna give a special shout out to some of our regular folks, Terry and Chuck, who are joining us from further north in Florida, and Laszlo, who is joining us from Vienna, Austria. All right, Ashley, if you could please just go and put your last slide on there. Great. I'll happily take any questions. Uh, like I said in my talk, I'm from, just, I've been doing a lot of my work in Chesapeake Bay before I moved to Florida. These are actually the first sediment cores that I took uh, in Biscayne Bay. So I thought it was a nice, I wanted to show those to you guys. They're just so pretty. You can see some nice uh, sand and then some different colors, so indicating the quality of the sediment. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ashley. That was terrific. It is just after 1230. So if you have to jump off, not a problem. We're going to be staying on to answer questions from the chat at this time. So you can go ahead and start loading up the chat with those burning questions as they relate to water quality. And we will be sending out a follow-up email with the link to this recording. And in two weeks, we will have Kasia Williams from Miami-Dade Eco Adventures talking about the myths and truths of recycling in South Florida. So we hope that you'll join us in two weeks for that. And in the meantime, please stay safe and well. And Ashley, I invite you to turn your camera on so you can chat with your participants and Ed and I will both be monitoring the chat box for any questions you all have.